Welcome and good morning. Hope you guys are all doing great today again and hope you're staying safe and uh, staying warm here and uh, enjoying uh, what's hopefully the end of this COVID time. I keep hoping these uh, vaccines are going to really get some traction. Numbers are going to keep dropping and we'll get back to normal before too long. So that's, uh, that's my prayer. I suspect many of you are praying that with me as well. Uh, as far as I know and last I've heard, folks are doing well. Uh, nobody is in our church family in any event um, getting worse, uh, but folks are getting better. They're on the mend, so we thank God for that and keep praying for people and pray for those of us who are, uh, not me, but us generally who are kind of on the front lines of people who work in hospitals, people who are uh, caretakers, people who are in situations where they're with vulnerable people and, and uh, just dealing with this virus in ways that most of us aren't. Pray that they are encouraged and, uh, and, and safe. I uh, do want to remind all of you that we have, uh, the service is open to the public at 1030 if you are uh, willing to come and register and have your temperature taken and uh, answer a questionnaire just to make sure you haven't been in contact with anyone who is sick. And it, we do wear masks and we social distance and that service is from 1030 to 1130 here at the church. And these, as I've said before, uh, YouTube versions of the message and the prayer will uh, continue to be put up here for you if you are going to be staying home yet for another uh, another season or until this is completely over with. So, if you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Psalm 29. Psalm 29 is it's one of my favorite psalms. I have a lot of favorite psalms. This is definitely one of them. And it's a psalm that describes a weather event where a storm is formed out over the Mediterranean and sweeps across the northern section of uh, Israel and off into the, the desert towards Damascus. And so see if you can hear some of that, uh, that movement as I uh, read through this psalm. It's a wonderful call to worship and a tremendous introduction to uh, Job chapter 37. Hear the word of God. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you and we praise you, and we do join with all in your temple and say glory. As we behold your wondrous works and see uh, what your hand has wrought here in this world, in this universe, Lord, and uh, the history that is uh, completely under your purview. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your sovereign power. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for the great privilege it is for us to be called into fellowship with you by the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can worship you as your people, your church, that were separated by distance and joined uh, by technology here. Lord, we thank you that uh, far greater than that is the Spirit that unites us. And Lord, we pray that you bless us. We pray that you help us to, to hear from you as your word is read and a faithful word about you as your word is preached. And Lord, as we sing uh, hymns and uh, listen to Christian music at home in our worship, uh, Lord, we pray that you would be blessed and honored. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. In your Bibles, I'd like to again invite you to turn. Just go back a handful of pages to Job chapter 36. If you remember from last week, I read Job chapter 36 through verse uh, 23. Today I'm going to start with verse 22 and read through the end of uh, chapter 37. So this is the, the second half 
of Elihu's fourth speech. And just, I think it's very helpful to give a little bit of a reminder of what's gone before so we can kind of catch the flow of this part of Scripture, how it fits into the context of the book of Job as a whole. Remember, Job has uh, finished arguing and debating with his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and, and, and Zophar. He's done debating with them. They've run out of arguments. They've become weary, and so has Job. And at the end of that long uh, debate with his friends, Job makes a couple of speeches in which he defends himself. And after that, there's presumably silence that is only filled when a young man named Elihu. Elihu, in chapter 32 of the book of Job, we read he's, he's angry. He's angry that no one has successfully defended the integrity of God. And he's angry that sin has not been checked. The sin of challenging God and accusing God of being unjust. All of which happened in the conversations between Job and his friends. And so Elihu gives four speeches. And between his speeches, he in the first two, he explicitly invites Job to respond. But Job, perhaps wearied, remember he's a very sick man at this time, uh, does not respond. Uh, he doesn't respond again, in fact, until after God speaks to him out of the whirlwind. Elihu, in his four speeches, very carefully covers a couple of key points. He begins in his first speech by saying that God is just in all that he does all the time. And God does, in fact, punish the wicked and redeem the righteous or deliver them. His timeline can't be relegated to our whims, however, or what we see. And we can't judge him, Elihu says, just because he's being silent. Or we don't see what he's doing at any given point in our life. Elihu goes on to address Job's complaint that Job has kind of been good for nothing. When Job asks, what do I gain? What advantage is there in obeying the Lord? Uh, look at how badly I'm doing right now. And Elihu exhorts Job in chapter 35 not to complain against the Lord and not to let his prayers be hindered by such complaints, but instead to come before him meekly, thanking him for the fact that he has made Job wiser than the animals and that he has blessed him with purpose, uh, bearing the image of God, in fact. Now, beginning in chapter 36, we have this last great speech. And it breaks into two parts. First it says, Behold, the Lord is mighty in the strength of his understanding. And this second part says, Behold, he exalted, he is exalted in his power. So li listen for that beginning. And we are going to be thinking as we read this text and hear it uh, preached about the great power of God against the backdrop of his uh, deep and wide, strong and true wisdom. So before I read this passage of scripture, please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for the parts that are easy to understand and the parts that take a little more work. And Lord, Job is a book that in so many ways is, uh, uh, Lord, it's, it's tough to understand sometimes with ancient phrases and idioms and turns of speech, Lord, and and long poems and uh, just difficult ideas. But Lord, we pray that as your word is read, we would be mindful that it comes from you to us. Oh, Spirit, we pray that you would open our eyes that we might see wonderful things in your law. Lord, we pray that the preaching that follows would be used to build up your church and to encourage your people and to call people to, to know you and to consider the wondrous works of the Lord. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Job chapter 36, beginning with verse 22, the word of God. Behold, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed for him his way? Or who can say, you have done wrong? Remember to extol his work, of which men have sung. All mankind has looked on it. Man beholds it from afar. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable, for he draws up the drops of water. They distill his mist and rain, which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. 
Can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thunderings of his pavilion? Behold, he scatters his lightning about him and covers the roots of the sea. For by these he judges peoples. He gives food in abundance. He covers his hands with the lightning and commands it to strike the mark. Its crashing declares his presence. The cattle also declare that he rises. At this also my heart trembles and leaps out of its place. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Under the whole heaven he lets it go and his lightning to the corners of the earth. After it his voice roars. He thunders with his majestic voice and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise to the downpour, his mighty downpour. He seals up the hand of every man, that all men whom he made may know it. Then the beasts go into their lairs and remain in their dens. From its chamber comes the whirlwind, and cold from the scattering winds. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick cloud with moisture. The clouds scatter his lightning. They turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world, whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen. Hear this, O Job. Stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know how God lays his command upon them and causes the lightning of his cloud to shine? Do you know the balancings of the clouds, perfect in knowledge? You whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind? Can you, like him, spread out the skies hard as a cast metal mirror? Teach us what we shall say to him. We cannot draw up our case because of darkness. Shall it be told him that I would speak? Did a man ever wish that he would be swallowed up? And now no one looks on the light when it is bright in the skies, when the wind has passed and cleared them. Out of the north comes golden splendor. God is clothed with awesome majesty, the Almighty. We cannot find him. He is great in power, justice, and abundant righteousness he will not violate. Therefore men fear him. He does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. This ends the reading of God's Word. Well, as you know, I, I think fairly highly of Elihu. Not everyone shares my perspective on Elihu, but in this passage of Elihu, there is pretty much a unanimous consensus among every pastor, uh, theologian, scholar that I've come across in my studies on the book of Job, that this last part of this last speech of Elihu is an introduction of sorts to what God will himself say. In fact, God kind of picks up exactly where Elihu leaves off, and God reiterates the exact same points. Now, if you go back and remember that uh, Elihu in chapter 32, had, in his first speech, emphasized strongly to Job and his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, that God does speak. And one of the ways God speaks is he sends messengers, people, to speak on his behalf. And here, in effect, we're seeing that God even used Elihu to speak on his behalf. Remember, this fourth speech in chapter 36 begins with Elihu saying that I have yet something to say on God's behalf. You see, Elihu is one of these messengers that God sends sometimes to teach, to correct, to admonish, to rebuke, to exhort. He, he's using Elihu to prepare and to invite Job to consider God's case. Now, Job doesn't respond to Elihu, but as we'll see in weeks to come, Job does respond to God. Well, what exactly is Elihu saying on God's behalf in this speech? He's talking about the mighty works of God. He's already demonstrated that God's wisdom is unsearchable, that the, the might of the strength of God's understanding is, in a sense, it's immense. It's without limit. God knows all things. And his, his wisdom is such that we, we couldn't even begin to wrap our heads around it. When we think about who God is and what God knows and how God acts in history and in our own lives, I think it's very helpful to distinguish between comprehension and apprehension. 
Comprehension, to comprehend something or to have a comprehensive grasp of a field of study, it conveys the idea that you know what is to be known about it. To apprehend means that you, you've got the basic outline in place. You know, there are certain things we can apprehend without comprehending. And when we come to our knowledge of God, we have to recognize that there's a sense in which God is both knowable and unknowable. There's a sense in which we can know God truly and authentically, experientially, dogmatically, but that knowledge is always going to be partial. It's always going to be susceptible to blurriness and confusion. Remember the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, after he extols love as the greatest of all gifts, he says, now we know in part, then we will know in full. Now we see as in a mirror darkly. That's how the old translations read it. And, you know, the, the idea of if you had a, an ancient mirror from the first century A.D., and if it was polished bronze or if you were really rich silver, uh, the surface isn't flat like we get from our, you know, highly machined uh, post-industrial revolution, wonderful mirrors today that give us very, very true pictures of what we look like. Uh, our window panes are, in a sense, perfect. They're free from the 18th century bubbles and warps of their methodology that left everything blurry when you look through it. But when the Apostle Paul talks about our knowledge, our spiritual knowledge, even of God, he says that we have to remember that on this side of heaven, there is an imperfection to our understanding of what God is doing in his world. And though we truly know him, there is a sense in which we will know him far more clearly and better. We will have, have a knowledge of him that overcomes our own weakness, our frailty, our insecurities, our own sins. And that's something to anticipate greatly. So in this last speech, we're going to see both of these ideas at play. The hiddenness of God, but also the revelation of God. And when we come back to the end of this sermon in 25 minutes or so, you'll see how that all fits together in an invitation to live by, live by faith. Now... There are three great moments in this last speech of, Job, of, of Elihu to Job. One is a reference to the storm, one is to the winter, and one is to the bright sun and the clear skies. The storm is an image that ancient people frequently associated with God. Marduk, a deity in the Ancient Near Eastern religions was associated as God of the storm. So was, uh, there were a lot of different Baals associated with different elements of ancient life. And Baal was typically, uh, in the Canaanite myth, uh, associated with storms as well. And God in the Bible makes it clear that he is the God of every aspect of life. He's the God over the flood. He's the God of the harvest. He's the God over uh, giving children. He's the God over uh, families. He's the God over the storms. We saw that in the call to worship in Psalm uh, 29, where the voice of the Lord is in the thunder and the lightning of the, of the storm. And not just the storm over his national territory, but the storm as it forms over the Mediterranean, crosses through northern Israel, and on into Syria and the regions of uh, Kadesh. Now, this passage about the storm that Elihu shares with Job is notable, perhaps mostly, for what Elihu does with the storm. Now, I want you to think about this. Elihu begins by talking about the, the water cycle. God is great, he says in verse 26, and we know him not. That's the hiddenness of God. Uh... The number of his years is unsearchable. There's things about God that we can't even begin to fathom. But we see what he does, and we can behold him from afar. That's the knowability of God. For, and this is the works of God, he draws up the drops of water, they distill his mist and rain, which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. Can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thunderings of his pavilion? Behold, he scatters his lightning about him, covers the roots of the sea. For by these he judges people, he gives food in abundance. And that is what's so key. We're going to see this again when he talks about the winter storms. This storm 
is used by God, the same storm is used by God to judge peoples, and it's also used to give food in abundance. So Elihu is saying that this God who is uh, immense in his wisdom, he's so great in his power that he can use the same meteorological event to dispense justice and to provide food. And Elihu himself notes how in the ancient world, uh, the storm is a, can be a terrifying event. Look at chapter 37, verse 1. Yeah, at, right after uh, chap verse 32 and 33 of chapter 36, uh, this picture of God whose hands are covered with lightning, whose uh, crashing declares his presence, and the cattle declare that he rises. You know, the cattle themselves uh, run for shelter. At this, Elihu says, also my heart trembles and leaps out of its place. Keep listening to the thunder. And there's five verses of beautiful ancient poetry describing the thunder and lightning of God's voice and presence and the way that it calls upon us to uh, acknowledge that there are things he does, verse 5, that we cannot comprehend. Just the absolute power of God. And over weather. We have a lot of things. We have. I still remember when uh, cable TV was a new thing, when it was brand new, and it was a great deal if uh, if you got cable TV. It was something you talked about at the lunch table with your friends. We didn't get cable TV until I was in high school, and I can remember the fascination that uh, we had with watching the Weather Channel, and it seemed like we had it all figured out. That scientists could look at everything. Doppler radar was a, an innovation, I believe, from the, the late '60s or the '70s. And we, we had it figured out. Well, how many times have you been to a baseball game and had a rain, rain delay that wasn't expected? How many times have you had a church picnic and all of a sudden realized you wish you'd have planned a rain date because things didn't work out? Even to this day, despite our... Uh, there are so many things we understand in such detail. Even now, the weather is not 100% predictable. Thus, the forecast, 20% chance of rain, 70% chance of rain. How rare it is that we can say, oh, 100% chance of this, 100% chance of that. Well, God knows all of it. He understands it in detail. And his use of that, it's not just God's power, but his use of it is so carefully finessed to accomplish his purposes, judgment and blessing. And... Job was failing to stand in awe of God's ability to use something, even something terrible, even an affliction, for good. Remember earlier in this speech, in chapter 36, Elihu had made the startling claim that God delivers the afflicted by their affliction. And he opens their ears by adversity, that God knows how to use even the storms of life to, in a sense, rescue those of us who are complacent or lost or bewildered. And in the same way that God uses the storms to saturate the ground with the moisture necessary to bring up a crop that will feed us for the season to come, that same storm might be terrifying in different aspects. So Elihu understands the power and the wisdom of God in such a way that he is humbled by the works of God he sees in the world around him, and he extols God, and he remembers. And this is what he's reminding Job to do. Job, worship. Remember to extol God. That's the storm. What about the winter? After this five-verse uh, poetic interlude in which Elihu talks about his own response to the incomprehensible works of God that seem so terrifying, he gives us another example. For to the snow, he, God says, fall on the earth. Likewise to the downpour, his mighty downpour. He seals up the hand of every man, that all men whom he made may know it. He seals up the hand of man. This is an idea of he makes it so that man can't work any longer. And we know exactly what he means by the Hebrew parallelism in the next verse. Listen, he seals up the hand of every man, that all men whom he made may know it, then the beasts go into their lairs and remain in their dens. No, every one of us finds that it is impossible to resist the power of the snow day. I remember when I was pastoring a church in Vermont, one year we got snow so bad 
that the snow was piled up pretty in a drift to the top of the door to get out of the house. And when that happens, you're not going anywhere until the snow plows come through and until you've had your, your third shift out there with a shovel trying to move the weather or the effects of the weather. And there's a sense in which God, in his calling and commanding of the weather, he is able to tell us when we can work, when we can't, when the animals can go out and forage or hunt, and when they have to stay in their dens. The power of God demonstrated in the seasons in winter. And he goes on. From its chamber comes the whirlwind, and cold from the scattering winds. By the breath of God ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick cloud with moisture. The clouds scatter his lightning. They turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world, whether for correction, or for his land, or for love, he causes it to happen. And here again, we see Elihu, just like he did with respect to the storm, saying that we need to be in awe not only of God's power over the weather, but his purpose in it. See, this is a picture of God here in this this figure of the, the, the winter effects, the winter storms, the snow, the cold, cold freezing rains of winter, the, the winds that, uh, that, that come relentlessly. God causes all these things to happen. He commands them, we read in verse 12, verse 13, whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen. Remember earlier, Elihu had said to Job that the storm is caused for judgment and that it would provide abundance and uh, bless people with food. And God is capable of doing something and accomplishing multiple things through it. And here, with respect to the difficulties and the hardships of winter, uh, Job is being reminded by, by Elihu that God is up to things, even in these, these storms that disrupt your work schedule and cause you to hunker down and hold your breath and wait till it passes. He says God does these things, whether for correction, sometimes to arrest a bad situation, sometimes to rebuke or to correct, this is a picture of judgment. It's literally sometimes for the rod, that's the literal Hebrew, sometimes for the land, here the earth. Sometimes God is doing uh, performing weather events because he's the creator who cares about the land and all that that means for human and animal nourishment and life. And sometimes for hesed. Now hesed is a word that generally is translated in your Old Testaments uh, as either goodness, kindness, or mercy. Some, something in there. Hesed is a uh, a Hebrew concept, an ancient Near Eastern concept, not limited simply to Hebrew, that is, it's focused on the goodness and the pleasure of the person. So, for example, if you're someone who delights in doing good things for others because you love them and you're merciful, there's a, you could be kind of qualified as being hesed in your nature. And here's a picture that, that different Bible scholars from rabbis through uh, modern day new, uh, Christian seminary professors look at this and they bring up the very real possibility that what Elihu is saying here is, look, Job, sometimes God does this to correct or to admonish. Sometimes he's motivated uh, to cause weather because of his concerns with wielding his rod, correcting and directing and, and admonishing man. Sometimes it's for the earth, that the earth might do what it, what it must and needs to do in order to provide for the life God has ordained. And sometimes because it brings him pleasure. And, you know, it's an interesting thought that we tend to put ourselves at the very center of every single thing God does, as if everything God does is motivated purely out of his concern for us to be uh, happy, healthy, uh, wealthy, and wise. I'm reminded of the psalm that points us to the sea where God formed the Leviathan to frolic. I want you to think about that ancient piece of Hebrew poetry. Who derives delight from the whale frolicking out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in 1200 BC? Only God. You see, there's a sense in which God delights in his creation that's lost on us. That we tend, because we're so man-centered in our approach to nearly every single thing we do, that we don't stop to think that sometimes God does this 
for the sheer joy and love of it. And that's an important insight that Elihu brings to the table, somewhat subtly, but it's nonetheless there. And God enables even us to share in that. Now, I've been in some tremendous storms in my life, especially being on the East Coast. I remember once a couple friends of mine when we were in college, we took all the teenage boys in the church that were able to come. So I think we took about, there was three of us, uh, college guys, and I was doing youth ministry at the time. And we took uh, 12 or 15 high school boys to Cape Charles, the southern tip of the Delmarva Peninsula. And a, a tropical storm was, was coming up, and it veered in a way that the meteorologists hadn't predicted. And uh, that storm, fortunately, the, the camper we had and the tents we'd set up were in the shelter in the lee of a couple of very, very large pine trees, so we were protected. But there were whole trailers, you know, 25, 30-foot-long trailers that were flipped over on their backs by that wind. And it was at once terrifying, but it was awesome to see that happening to see the wind, to see the waves. And there's a sense in which uh, when we look and we see the weather, the big snows, yes, it's inconvenient. Yes, it's frightening when it's happening. There's a beauty there as well. But when God causes these things to happen, we need to extol his works. That was Elihu's thesis at the beginning of this part of the speech. Behold, God is exalted in power. Remember to extol his works and thank him for the things he's doing, for the rod, for the earth, and for love. Because God's purposes, even though we don't understand exactly how they may be accomplished by what God is doing in any specific moment, are revealed to us. That somehow or other God is rejuvenating the land that it might sustain his people. Some... And, and feed animals, a great concern of God, as we'll see in God's own speech in a couple of chapters. Sometimes it's to correct us. Sometimes it is to demonstrate this greater picture of Hesed. Well, Elihu finishes his speech to Job by speaking to Job directly. Up until this point, Elihu's been speaking generally to Job, to Eliphaz, to Bildad, Zophar, and presumably other people that are gathered around listening to these debates and conversations. And he says, hear this, O Job, stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Hear this, O Job. He's getting Job's attention. Perhaps Job is weary from listening to this long sermon, four long sermons back to back to back to back. Job is no doubt wearied from his sick, weakened condition and his intense debates with his best friends who were very unsympathetic to him. And Elihu is fixing Job's attention. Hear this, Job. Stop and consider the wondrous works of God. And if I had to summarize all of Elihu's speeches, I would, suffer them, I would summarize them with two sentences. God is greater than man. That's his theme from beginning to end. And stop and consider the wondrous works of God. That is our right response to the God who is so great. And I think the problem with many of us in our lives today is that we don't stop. We don't arrest our fears and our thoughts that just spin like crazy and just distract us and dismay us and drive us into uh, uh, fits of despondency. We don't stop and tear our attention away from those things we perceive as so difficult or terrible or awful and simply consider the wondrous works of God, the wonder of what he's doing in the storms. And that word wonder is important. It belies an awe, something that is not merely rational. You see, I don't know what God is doing in the storms of my life, but I marvel and I wonder at what he's doing in those storms. Because God is always up to something, and the somethings to which God is up are unbelievable. You couldn't imagine them if it was spelled out for you. You wouldn't be able to fit it into your head. The God who sees the beginning together with the end, who sees how justice is affected at the same time as young ravens are fed. 
the God who understands uh, blood clotting and understands how antibodies are created on the molecular level with different cellular machinery in your body that scientists are only beginning to marvel at the irreducible complexity of life. And God understands that better than you do one plus one. Marvel, wonder at the works of God. And Elihu asks Job some questions. He says, do you know how God lays his command? Do you know how he causes the lightning of his cloud to shine? Do you know the balancings of the clouds? The wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? You whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind. <laughs> I love that verse. And we're very, very privileged to have a special way of understanding that here in Southern California, in the San Fernando area anyway, because we have Santa Ana winds. Those hot winds that come up, and if you're caught wearing too many layers, you swelter. You can barely breathe. The grit is getting into your throat and your nose and your eyes, and it's horrible. And that's the picture here. You whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind. It's a picture of a, a blistering hot wind coming along, and there you are, uh, sweating, powerless to do anything but find shelter. So in a sense, Elihu is saying, do you understand how God does all this and controls all this and instructs all these things to happen when you can't even regulate uh, how to dress for a given day because you don't know what's going to happen? Teach us what we shall say to him, Elihu asks Job. We cannot draw up our case because of darkness. You know, we can't bring a law case before God because we don't understand enough. We don't know what God is doing in the storms of our life that we complain about so boisterously. We just know how it affects us right now. And Elihu has been pleading with Job to consider that the right now of how I experience the effects of the storms God has decreed for my life can be translated from pity and grief and confusion to trust and faith and praise. If only I will acknowledge in theory at first that God by affliction redeems or delivers the afflicted. He opens our ears by adversity. Even when he's bringing a rod, he's feeding us through the rains, wondering at the mighty works of God. Shall it be told God, Elihu says, that I would speak? This, we're still in the arena of the courtroom. Elihu's suggesting to Job, should I say to God, God, it's my turn. Now you listen to me, God. And Elihu then says, did a man ever wish that he would be swallowed up? Just the foolishness of such a thought. And yet that is precisely what righteous Job in his deep suffering has fallen to. You see, Job did not sin and then suffer. Job, the righteous man, suffered and then he sinned. And this is what God rebukes him for. This is what Elihu, this messenger, rebukes Job for. And this is what Job ultimately will repent of. You see, Elihu's right. Job did tell God that he, Job, would speak. The very last thing that Elihu says to Job, it has the sound of the very last verses of Ecclesiastes. It says, And now, no one looks on the light when it is bright in the skies, when the wind has passed and cleared them. So when the wind has come and swept every cloud out of the skies, and the sky is bright, and the light rises, the sun, no one can look at the sun. Out of the north, remember the north, the ancient language was Zaphon, a place associated by the ancients before God established his temple on Mount Zion as the abode of the gods. Out of the north comes golden splendor. God is clothed with awesome majesty. This picture of God rising, when God reveals himself in his works, so bright and radiant, we can't look at him directly any more than we could look at the sun on a clear day. The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is great in power. This idea of the incomprehensible God, of whom we can merely begin to sing his praises and begin to define his attributes and can merely make a beginning of knowing him and worshiping him and loving him. And we're going to spend an eternity in heaven 
learning how to do those things more fully and completely, knowing in full what we just do in part. The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is great in power, justice, and abundant righteousness he will not violate. And there is Elihu's three points. God is just. He is powerful. He is not a hater. He does not do wrong. Therefore men fear him. He does not regard any who are wise in their own pride. What a series of messages Elihu had for Job. As I think about how to, to borrow a phrase from this uh, sermon of Elihu, how can we distill from all of this uh, something of a spiritual mist to uh, uh, dampen the soil of our hearts that we can produce a crop? I want you to think about how the storms of our life, the winters of our life, are season w in, in which we can choose to look at them in terms of how we experience them on our worst days, or we can be careful to remember to extol the Lord and praise him for his works, which in a sense are, and I love this word, in a sense his works are inscrutable. That's a word that conveys the idea of we, we can't fully understand exactly what he's doing. But we know that he has appointed a time for everything. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, a time to be born and a time to die. Time to gather, a time to scatter, a time to build, a time to tear down, a time for peace, a time for war. That in God's grand economy, there is a sense in which, because of the rod, because of the earth, and because of love, God is up to things. And his wisdom is such that we can trust that one day we will understand what today we merely believe that God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And even the storms of our life are storms in which we can thank God for the abundance of life-giving water. We can thank God for the wonders of his correction and the faithfulness of his use of the rod. We can thank him for taking care not only of us, but of all creatures large and small. We can thank him for being so majestic in power and incomprehensible in wisdom. Won't you consider the wondrous works of God? And as you do that, be absolutely certain that you don't neglect to consider the fact that he could communicate and address himself to people like us. People like us who are so, uh, so much less than Job. People like us who are certainly not among the most righteous people living on the earth today. People like us who are sinners, broken, weak, wounded, easy to stray, that's us. And yet this God speaks through his messengers to give us this message, to humble ourselves before him, to consider his works, and to trust him. And ultimately, God came in the person of Christ, who spoke far more clearly and with far more power than a lie he ever could because Christ was the very Son of God. And the same Christ who came and he calmed the storms and he walked on the water, he says to you and me, come follow me and I will give you rest. Whatever storms you're in, I would invite you to listen to the voice of that teacher, that shepherd, that minister who comes on behalf of God to draw you to himself. Pray with me and receive this Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the invitation of Christ to come with repentance and faith. Lord, we confess that we have, like Job, we have complained so many times against you. We have so many times clenched our fists and stamped our foot and, say, and, and said as, as if we were saying, God, it's my turn to talk, now you listen to me. And oh God, forgive us for that, that pride, that conceit. And Father, teach us instead to fear you um, and to stop being so wise in our own eyes and to simply trust that you are the God who is in perfect control of what you are doing and you are always doing it for uh, reasons that would amaze us and humble us were we to have a, a, a just even the, the briefest picture of what you're up to. And Father, we thank you that you gave us Christ to live and die for us that we might have life in him. And Father, help us to know him, help us to trust him, and help us to walk with him and for his glory. 
in the winters, in the storms, and on the bright sunny days. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, friends, I hope to see you soon, and I hope you're doing well. And until that day when we're able to shake hands and maybe even give each other a, a hug, uh, have a great, uh, great day and a great week, and I'll see you real soon. Bye now.